John's journey to the island of Patmos and his subsequent visions, including that of the 24 elders, is one of the most intriguing episodes in the Bible. After addressing the seven churches, John suddenly found himself in God's own throne room. He saw God seated on a throne, appearing like precious stones. Around this throne were twenty-four other thrones and seated on them were the twenty-four elders. These elders wore white robes with golden crowns on their heads. The elders, along with the four living creatures around the throne, prostrated themselves before God, casting their crowns before him and declaring, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power because you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Nowhere in the book of Revelation are the identities of the 24 elders detailed, however, it is highly probable that they are representatives of the church. Some believe they are angelic beings, however, this is highly unlikely. Clearly, they reign alongside Christ, and the fact that they are seated on thrones repeatedly proclaims that the church governs and reigns with Christ. The Greek word translated as elders in this context is never used to refer to angels. It is used exclusively to refer to men who have reached a certain age and are capable of governing the church. As angels do not age, the term elder cannot be attributed to them. Job 40 verses 15 to 19. Look at the behemoth, which I made along with you. It eats grass like an ox. Here, its strength is in its loins and its power in the muscles of its belly. It moves its tail like a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are tightly knit. Its bones are like tubes of bronze its limbs like bars of iron. It is the first of the ways of God. Only its creator can approach it with his sword. The identity of the behemoth is one of the few biblical creatures that historians have long debated. The academic community is still trying to reach a consensus on many aspects of this creature. But they know two things. It was huge and had a navel. The Hebrew word, behemoth, has the same form as the plural of the Hebrew word, bima, which means beast. It is possible that such a beast roamed the earth alongside people. Was the behemoth a hippopotamus? Many people think that God had in mind what we call a hippopotamus, one of the largest, most powerful, and dangerous terrestrial animals in the world. Those who favor the hippopotamus do so because Job 40, verse 23, talks about the behemoth's huge mouth drinking the flowing Jordan River. Based on verse 19, it seems that the creature described in the story of Job was too large for the people of the time to defeat. These descriptions cannot be attributed to any current animal. Cherubim will not deny the most humble Christian access to the throne. They assure us that we can go boldly because of Christ's work on the cross. The veil in the temple was torn. The Morning Star, the book of Isaiah chapter 14, introduces us to a being known as Lucifer. Lucifer literally means the one who brings light in Latin. The word is translated as morning star in Hebrew. Lucifer was portrayed as a brilliant, shining, and wonderful deity in all languages. Melchizedek, now we discuss the only human on our list. No character in the Bible is more mysterious than the person of Melchizedek. When we first meet him, he is living in the time of Abraham. Even the name Melchizedek carries an air of mystery, making a silent entry into the canon of the scriptures. Who is he? Why is there so much discussion about him? He is mentioned in both the Old and New Testaments. Why does our epic story begin with a man named Abraham, the true meaning of his name? Many of us are not familiar with the workings of names in Hebrew and in the Bible. Names in the Bible are not just descriptive, they also carry authority. For example, the name God gave to Adam meant, of the earth, describing what Adam was made of. Names in the Bible can represent human hopes and divine revelations or are used to illustrate prophecies. So, what is the meaning of the name Melchizedek? The name Melchizedek has a significant meaning in Hebrews, verse 2. It means king of justice or the king is just. This name implies that the person with this name is just and fair in his actions. It is an appropriate name for a ruler or leader who upholds justice and righteousness in his realm. Melchizedek is used to explain the mysteries of Jesus. Just as Melchizedek is the king of peace, Jesus is also the king of peace. In the prophecy of Isaiah about the one to come, he says. The second information about Melchizedek that can be discovered in Genesis chapter 14 is that he presented Abraham with bread and wine. From that morning until the end of the appointed time, the Lord sent a plague on Israel and 70,000 people died from Dan to Beersheba. When the angel extended his hand to destroy Jerusalem, 
the Lord repented of the disaster and told the angel afflicting the people, Enough, withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then in the threshing floor of Ariuna the Jebusite. When David saw the angel striking the people, he said to the Lord, I have sinned. What are the seraphim? The seraphim are divine beings created by God to serve and worship. These angelic creatures with six wings are constantly present at the throne of God. The prophet Isaiah tells us that the seraphim are six-winged, fiery angels that surround God as he sits on his exalted throne and continually worship God. Isaiah chapter 6. The seraphim also minister to the Lord and serve as his agents of purification, as demonstrated in the cleansing of Isaiah's sins before he began his prophetic ministry. The term seraphim appears in the Bible only in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 is the only passage in the Bible that uses the term seraphim, which means, the burning ones. The seraphim appear to be human, as Isaiah describes them as having faces, feet, hands, and voices. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a high and exalted throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Above him were the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. These angels may appear as burning flames. The term seraph derives from the Hebrew verb, seraph, which literally means, burn with fire, or, more specifically, destroy with fire. The reverence of the angels for God should remind us of our own arrogance when we rush thoughtlessly into his presence, as we often do, because we do not understand his holiness. In Revelation chapter 4, John's vision of the throne of God was similar to that of Isaiah in reverence and fear of the holy. Living creatures gathered around the throne cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The seraphim also ministered to God and served as his agents of purification. When Isaiah perceived the celestial seraphim covering themselves before God to admit their unworthiness before him, the Lord became aware of his own mortal sin and feared for his life. At that point, one of the seraphim took a coal with tongs from the altar, brought it to Isaiah, and placed it on his lips. The seraph assured Isaiah that his guilt had been removed and his sin atoned for as a result of that act. God's image is restored and reflected in the world. His strategy is to try to corrupt and divert Christians from their path, seeking to weaken their faith and compromise their testimony. In response to Satan's fall, God did not remain passive. He intervened by sending Jesus Christ, the perfect expression of his image to redeem and restore humanity through the light, death, and resurrection of Christ. God offered salvation and the opportunity for transformation into the image of his Son. This transformation is an ongoing process in the life of the Christian where we are gradually molded into the likeness of Christ. This happens as we submit to the Holy Spirit and live according to Christ's teachings. However, the final victory belongs to God through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Satan was defeated and those who put their faith in Christ had the promise of eternal life and full restoration to the image of God. This constant spiritual conflict between good and evil, between God and Satan, is a central theme in the biblical narrative. It reminds us of the importance of remaining faithful to God and resisting the temptations and deceptions of Satan knowing that in Christ we have the victory and the promise of a glorious future with God. God bless everyone for watching the video. If you liked it and want to see more, please subscribe to the channel. Comment your ideas and impressions and don't forget to give that wonderful like.